Hey guys, Abel here. In this video, we are going to be talking about exercises that were game changers for me over time. So again, somewhat on popular demand, we are going to be talking about exercises that were really helpful for me over time and at times almost revolutionized my training. We will see how much some of the recommendations and the exercises I will be listing in this video will be helpful for you, but hopefully you will be able to apply at least some of the principles and some of the exercises as well. So just before we actually get into the exercises themselves, first just let's, the, let's pose the question, what actually makes for an effective exercise? And I'm going to be linking a video down below. If you haven't seen that article, then I would highly recommend it. It's been written by Menno Henselmans. And basically the article details what the criterion is that a given exercise has to meet in order to classify that as a good and effective exercise for a given muscle group. And it talks about things like the limiting factor, which is perhaps the most important thing to consider when we want to determine how effective an exercise is for a given muscle group. So for example, if we think about a cable pack fly, unless you have a shoulder injury, which would limit you from performing that exercise, almost for everybody across the board, the chest is going to be the limiting factor in that exercise. Whereas if we look at something like an overhead squat, when you're squatting with your hands up high, then your shoulder and your shoulder joint is going to limit you from cranking out more reps before actually your quads would give out. So it's just not a very effective exercise for the quads. It also talks about things like tissue stress distribution. So basically, how effectively your muscles are getting stimulated relative to the surrounding connective tissue and tendons that are also involved in, in that exercise. And we can of course point out a couple of lifts and movements that are inherently more injurious than others, but it's also somewhat of an individual thing. So for example, for myself, perhaps because of some anatomical limitations, perhaps of because of my injury history, maybe some tendons and muscles got shortened in my arm and shoulder muscles. But when I'm doing overhead extensions with my arm up high, even when I'm doing it like this without any weight, my elbow is clicking like crazy. And, if, and then if I was to hold anything even as light as a two kilogram, four pound dumbbell, that would beat the shit out of my elbow. So in general, the overhead tricep extension is a good exercise. For me, it just doesn't work. So I'm always doing other stuff like tricep press downs and things that are perhaps less superior for a number of reasons, which we're not going to get into in this particular video. But some exercises that might work completely fine for some people because of this tissue stress distribution concept for me personally just don't work. And a lot of people have little things like that that will prevent them from performing one exercise or the other. So really the main point here is awareness. You need to be aware of what your body is telling you. What are the things that piss off your joints and what are the things that stimulate your muscles effectively? Awareness is key. This is what the Japanese call unagi. Just kidding. Let me know if you recognize the reference. Then there are also concepts like loadability, both absolute and micro loadability. So if you look at something like a goblet squat, which is sure a fine exercise for the quads when you're holding a dumbbell like this, because you will quickly get too strong and you will be able to hold or you would be able to hold really heavy dumbbells, your arms are going to be once again the limiting factor as opposed to your quads. Or if you're looking at something like a handstand push-up, if you reach full-on beast mode, I think this is something that the article specifically addresses, and you will be able to do handstand push-ups on a handle, perhaps with a weighted west on you, and you will be able to crank out 12 reps. Exactly how are you going to add more weight to that exercise? Are you going to balance a dumbbell on your foot when your legs are up high? It's just impractical. Or you could look at something like an inverted row with a suspension device like a TRX. That is an excellent exercise in general for the rear deltoids and traps and, and your upper back musculature in general, but it's just tough to load it if you don't have a partner to assist you. So I've seen Alberto Nunez, for example, performing it with pretty high weights because he has, a, he has someone to assist him in the gym. But for many of us, it's just simply awkward to lie on the gym floor and try to put a weight plate on your chest and then do your inverted rows. It's just impractical. And then there is also micro loadability. So basically how little are the increments by which you can progress from workout to workout. So if you're using dumbbell bench presses, for example, the dumbbell bench press has some interesting benefits compared to the barbell bench press, such as more freedom of movement and just, it can be more shoulder friendly and just easier on the joints. But the problem is that often the dumbbells will only go up by two kilograms. And if you're pretty strong and can do sets of eight with 40 kilo dumbbells, but then the next week you would have to use 42 kilo dumbbells, 
That's like a 5% increase in weight from one workout to the other. You would never do that on a barbell bench press, for example. Like you would never go from benching 80 kilos one week to 85 kilos the next week. No, you would probably go for 82.5 kilos the next week because that's the smallest increments that the gyms typically provide. And in general, you want to shoot for a 1% to 2% increment increase in the loads that you're using. And that will allow you to not get ahead of yourself too much when it comes to progression. So these are also things that the article details and I would highly recommend it. I will link it in the show notes below and you can check that out for yourself. But the main point is that it's pointless to argue whether one exercise is better than another exercise, just as much as it's pointless to argue whether a training program or a training split is more effective than another, another training split. It's never the actual name of the training split that we should argue over. It's how it organizes certain variables within your training that matter. For example, training intensity, frequency, and of course, volume. Depending on how that training split addresses those variables across a given time frame, like a week, that will determine how effective that training split is. And the same thing applies for exercises. Instead of arguing whether a front squat is better than a high bar squat, you should look at how that exercise ranks up based on this criteria for yourself. Now still, before we get into the actual exercises, just a couple of things I want to mention that were just really helpful for me over time to make my training more suitable for long-term progression and so sustainable, and also just really helpful from an overall injury management and muscle stimulation perspective. So the first tool would be myo reps, which was addressed a number of times on this channel. You Probably a lot of you will know what that is, but just in case you don't know, Myo reps is essentially an intensity technique, which will allow you to use light weights and high reps in a very time effective manner, because you will be able to train at the high level of muscle activation. So you will typically do a high rep set of say 15 to 30. And by the end of that high rep set, your muscles will be highly fatigued because you have pushed yourself close to muscular, muscular failure. And then you will insert a short rest period, and then you will crank out further sets of three to five, which at that point, because of that acute fatigue, will be as high quality sets or as challenging sets as a normal set of heavy fives would be without that pre-exhaustion with the high reps. And that will basically allow you to really exhaust your muscles, really stimulate growth without having to crank out endless sets of 30 because you have done that pre-exhaustion once and then you're training at that high muscle recruitment level uh, for extended periods. So if you're not familiar with the concept yet, uh, I would recommend the effective reps video, which is on my channel. I will link it here below. If you just type my name into YouTube and effective reps, then it will come out. Uh, but that would be my reps. The next concept would be katsu or blood flow restriction. So basically what you're doing with that is you're occluding a limb. So typically your arms or your thighs with a cuff. It could be an actual professional katsu cuff, which is what I ordered from eBay myself, or it could actually be a knee wrap, which you could also just tie up on your legs. Basically, the bigger the limb is that you want to restrict the blood flow in, the bigger the cuff should be that you're using. But basically, it's just a method of making lightweight work more effective once again, because by occluding the limb and restricting the return of venous blood flow, you're increasing metabolic stress within the muscle and you will be able to get a higher training stimulus from doing less reps with a really light weight. So for example, if you're using something like 30% of your 1RM, maybe normally you would be able to crank out sets of 50 or even 60. Whereas if you're occluding your limb, then you might be able to get a really good training stimulus and push yourself close to failure with 25 to 30 reps. And then if you combine katsu with my reps, then my gosh, like that will be a guts and absolute time saver. You will be able to stimulate your muscles really highly without actually having to slave away at the gym, cranking out endless sets of 50 or something crazy. Now, the last little tool that I want to mention here is micro plates, which are these little plate mate magnetic plates that I purchased from eBay. They were a ridiculous expense and you can probably get your hands on them a bit cheaper if you have a local distributor that sells them or maybe you can actually MacGyver it for yourself. I saw some DIY tutorials on YouTube where a guy was using chains that he bought from some hardware store and he created these little micro increments from them. But basically the point is, is that these tools allow you to make your progression a little bit more gradual. So again, if you have a weight stack, for example, which goes up by five kilos at a time or even two kilos at a time, 
on certain isolation moves, it can be just a ridiculous jump. So for instance, if you're doing cable lateral raises and you're doing five kilos for sets of 15, and then the next week you're trying to do that with 7.5 kilos, like my God, like that's a 50% increase. Would you go from benching 80 kilos one week to 120 kilos the next week? Of course not. Of course, that's ridiculous. So it can be really effective to make your progression a little bit more realistic and just hit the same rep target that you were shooting for in your previous workout or even to actually just keep you within a reasonable rep range within that rep target. So with the theory out of the way and some of the cool tools that helped me over time out of the way, let's get into discussing some of the exercises that were really helpful for me over time. The first exercise I want to mention is the lap prayer, which is a movement which was popularized once again by Manu Henselmans. It's basically a straight arm pull down type movement. I will play some clips for you here. But basically what you're doing is you're using a cable stack. You're standing in front of that with your arms nearly straight. And basically you're just contracting your lats by pulling your arm into your armpit with a straight arm. And this can be really, really helpful to kind of develop that mind-muscle connection, if you want to use that term, which is missing for a lot of people when it comes to the lats. And also, it can be just really helpful for training your lats really effectively without taxing your elbows a ton, which can be helpful when you're already training your upper body with a decent amount of volume. So you're doing pressing and pulling movements of all kinds. Maybe you're doing some arm isolation work already. So then taking your elbows out of the equation can be pretty helpful. This movement is also nice because it has just a really nice resistance curve. So there is just a lot of tension and stress on the lats throughout its whole range of motion. So all the way from the stretched position, all the way to the contracted position, you're getting a lot of stimulation for the lats. And just developing that mind-muscle connection can really help you to kind of feel your lats. And if earlier they have been a lagging muscle group for you, then perhaps it can help you to recruit it better at other movements as well. Now, a couple of notes on the lap prayer. You probably want to use higher reps on them. Probably in the 10 to 20 rep range is a good place to shoot for. It's not a strength exercise. The point here is to kind of feel the muscle. It's more of a feel exercise, almost like a cable lateral raise. You're not trying to hit massive PRs on it. You're just trying to get a really nice, pure stimulus for the muscle that you want to train. And the other important point here is that many people will feel their triceps a lot on this exercise and that will often limit them. So you can play around with the attachments that you're using. So for me, a rope attachment works pretty well. So I'm using the same rope attachment that I would use for a triceps press down. But if you're getting too much tricep stimulation, then you might want to try out a straight bar attachment and pulling it in like this and maybe then your triceps are not going to limit your lat stimulus. Okay, next exercise I want to touch on is a good chest press machine. And I know that a lot of people are going to cringe that I'm talking about a machine as opposed to the almighty bench press or an incline press. But I'm actually a big fan of finding a machine that suits you biomechanically, allows for good loadability and micro loadability, and basically just allows you to focus on nothing else but pressing that weight and maybe even involve some mind muscle connection stuff, focusing on the pack squeeze and how much you can flare your elbows out without causing yourself shoulder issues. And really, if you have any kind of pain or discomfort with free barbell movements, such as the bench press or dumbbell presses, then a good machine can really be just a godsend. I myself, when I'm benching, half of my attention is essentially focused on actually pressing the weight up and the other half of my attention is focused on not hurting my shoulder. And if you have issues like this, that will just limit you, practically speaking, from stimulating your muscles because pain and the fear of pain will inhibit muscle activation and simply just that neural inhibition will just basically stop you from exerting yourself as hard as you could. So a good chest press machine, especially if it's a converging chest press machine, which will have some resistance at the end range and you will get that nice pec squeeze at the end, really highly recommend that you try that out. But one final note here is that if you have an equipment which is good in basically every way, but it has a limited range of motion, which is pretty common, then you can experiment with putting a foam roller behind your back. This is something that I've implemented for myself. So I'm just putting the foam roller here and that allows me to bring the levers back further and just get a nicer stretch on my pecs. And it causes no back issues whatsoever. It doesn't compromise your stability once you find that sweet spot where you put that roller. And I'm hitting PRs on a regular basis. And basically, I'm as strong on that chest press machine if I 
convert it into bench press strength as someone should be at my training advancement, basically. And then the final thing I want to touch on, and I mentioned this a couple of times before, is a weighted push-up. So as you know, shoulder injuries, little aches and pains in the scapulae and just the shoulder area is one of the number one things that will limit a lot of people from progressing as far with the bench press as they could. I myself loved the bench press. Uh, it used to be just one of those really highly stimulating exercises for me for the chest. Uh, I was never one of those people who was more tricep dominant or didn't feel the chest or any of that. I built a good chunk of my chest with just bench pressing, but over time my shoulders just couldn't tolerate the bench presses once I've gotten strong enough. So I needed to look for alternatives. And besides the chest press machine that I just mentioned, a couple of uh, pec fly variations, weighted push-ups, which allow your scapulae to move freely, was just an absolute amazing total game changer. A lot of people look down on the push-ups because this is something that you do on PE class in elementary school and this is for kids. But if you find a way to load those push-ups and to keep yourself within a reasonable rep range, somewhere between 6 to 20 reps, then it can be an amazing way to, to train your chest. Uh, you have to be a little bit creative. You can wear a weighted vest if you have access to that. You can use a chest harness, which I've seen a couple of people do. I don't have access to that, but if you do, that is perhaps the best way because that is the best suited for long-term progression. I saw Umar Isab doing that in a lot of videos, and there is a company that actually sells both the stand on which you can put your hands on and also the chest harness that you can load up with weights. You can also be a little bit awkward in the gym if you have the balls to do that and wear a backpack and just load that up with plates. You can ask for a partner in the gym to assist you and put some plates on your back. You can also use a chin-up belt, which is what I've used for a long time. That can also be nice. Might not be as good as some of the previous options because your core will be somewhat of a limiting factor. But if you have a pretty strong core, then you can load up 50 kilos. And if you can crank out 12 reps with 50 kilos of weight hanging off of you with a chin-up belt, then you will be as strong as any other bro who is bench pressing in the gym. Earlier on, I did an episode just on push-ups, so I will link that also, and you can check that one out. Again, if you just YouTube my name and type in push-ups, it will probably come up. I also linked a calculator in there, which basically just helps you calculate how much weight you need to add to your push-ups to get a certain bench press equivalent. So if you're shooting for bench pressing three plates for eight reps, it will give you the number of how much weight you need to be adding for your push-ups to get that same equivalent training stimulus. So push-ups are just an amazing exercise. A lot of people look down on them, undeservedly so, because they are just so great. And it has been an absolute game changer as well. And then I could list a couple of other exercises as well, and maybe I will do in another video, but I'm just seeing here that this video have gone on for quite long but there are things like Bulgarian split squats, which you can find some ways in which they don't suck as much as they do for a lot of people. I could list cable pec flies. I could list calf raise variations of certain kinds, lateral raise variations of certain kinds, uh, but let's leave some exercises for other videos too. And I just hear this super annoying dog barking like crazy in the neighbor. So I'm going to wrap this video up because I will just get annoyed. And when I'm annoyed, I'm not able to speak very fluently. So let's just cut this video right here. Let me know what are exercises for you that were game changers and that help you to progress long term without getting injured or without running into issues with loadability or progression. I'm curious. I'm always looking for recommendations here. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please subscribe to get up to date on the video that comes out this Thursday and the interview that comes out after that, which actually will not be an interview, but a roundtable debate with Mike Isretel and Menno Henselmans on carbs and keto diets. And yeah, like the video, share it with other people who you think could benefit from this. And with that, see you next time.